Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Rosemary Gillespie, the Schlinger Chair in Entomology at the University of California at Berkeley. I have known, my, I have known Rosie my entire career, ever since we gave back-to-back -back talks at an international evolution conference back when we were both young pups back in 1988. Since then, I have watched Rosie emerge as one of the world's leading experts in island biogeography, a field, of course, that was established 50 years ago here at Harvard by E.O. Wilson. Rosie's work on the spiders and other inhabitants of the Hawaiian Islands has importantly changed how we study the diversity of islands. She has shown how we must integrate knowledge of geology, ecology, and evolution to understand the diversity of islands, why some islands have more species than others, why particular species occur on particular islands. But let's start at the beginning. As soon as Rosie begins to talk, you'll realize that she's not from around here. In fact, Rosie grew up in Scotland and graduated from the University of Edinburgh. She didn't always intend to study spiders. In fact, in her honors year at Edinburgh, she approached Philip Ashmole, whose specialty was the conservation and biology of island birds, hoping to do an honors project on studying birds under his supervision. Ashmole, however, had other ideas and gave her a project on spiders. And the rest, as they say, is history. After finishing her honors degree in Edinburgh, she crossed over the ocean over to here, where she did her doctoral work with renowned arachnologist Susan Reichert at the University of Tennessee. After that, she had a brief stint at the University of Hawaii before moving to the University of California, where she has been ever since. While there, she served as director of the Essig Museum of Entomology from 1999 to 2013, and also as chair of the Berkeley Natural History Museum Consortium from 2004 to 2012. In addition to those jobs, Rosie has also served as the president of the American Ar Arachnological Society, that's hard to say, and treasurer of the Inter International Society for Arachnology. As these positions suggest, Rosie is one of the world's leading experts on spiders and probably the leading scholar on the diversity of island spiders. Nonetheless, her more than 150 published papers are not confined either to spiders or to the Hawaiian Islands. She has worked on a wide variety of arthropods, including moths, beetles, and plant hoppers, and on islands ranging throughout the Pacific and elsewhere. Now, in addition to her organismal focus, Rosie is also a leading figure in the field of biogeography, as I already mentioned. She is currently president of the International Biogeography Society. In addition, several years ago, she edited this massive and highly acclaimed volume, which perhaps you can see is the Encyclopedia of Islands. It was an epic undertaking. In addition, she served as the, section, the biogeography section editor of the Encyclopedia of Evolutionary Biology. Well, I think you can see with these credentials why it is that Rosie was an obvious choice to be asked to speak in our Island Evolution series. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to have her here tonight. And she's going to speak, as you can see, on island time and the interplay between ecology and evolution and species diversification. So thanks, Jonathan. And thank you all for, for coming. This is a, a huge honor for me. And as Jonathan said, I've worked on a number of different islands, but I'm going to focus here tonight on um, the islands of the Hawaiian chain. Um, so, what, um, just to, as Jonathan said, I just want to kind of first start off by giving you a little bit of an introduction as to how I got to, to being here, what, what, what made me, what, what um, got me where, where I am today, what was the root here. And so, as Jonathan said, I come from this place here, which is Scotland. And you know what, what um, I say, I come from the southwest of Scotland, but um, people say, you know, oh, Glasgow or Edinburgh. And actually, you know, when you go up to Glasgow and Edinburgh, you've missed out this whole chunk of Scotland. So, you know, this is where I come from. And so this, this part here down in, in the southwest. So this is where I did my, my early work. And then, um, as Jonathan said, the next step was to do a PhD. And having become a, a spider person at the University of Edinburgh, I headed over to 
the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And it was here then that I started working on, on spiders on water. And this was interesting. This is the, the, the mountains of the Appalachians, which were close to Tennessee. And what I started to do was, was work on spiders that, that live right over the top of water. And this is the genus Tetragnatha. And so these spiders are, are um, they're long and skinny, and they're really rather boring, but, but one thing about them is that they, they very predictably build their webs over, um, right over water. And so because of that, they can reach um, fairly large aggregations, and they tend to um, build webs wh where insects are coming off the water and feed extensively on aquatic insects, just little weak flying insects. So very homogeneous group and, and interesting in some ways, but, but there you go. Um, they're not extremely exciting, to be honest. So it was after that that um, I came to do a postdoc and um, came all the way over to Hawaii. And so <clears throat> I want to just give you a bit of an introduction to Hawaii. I came over to Hawaii to look at um, actually the behavioral ecology of the Hawaiian happy face spider. These spiders I'll talk about in a little bit, but they're, they're really interesting spiders. This is all a single species. But they're interesting not so much in their behavioral ecology, which is, again, kind of boring, to be honest. But um, their color, this is a single population, and they have this tremendous array of colors. And so this turned out to be something that was really, really intriguing. But I want to just first give you an introduction to Hawaii. So, when we think of the Hawaiian Islands, you kind of, um, th this is what, when I first went to Hawaii, this is what I imagined. It's sandy beaches and, and warm water, palm trees, and this is, you know, when, when um, Mark Twain visited the islands, he said it's the loveliest fleet of islands that lies anchored in any ocean. They're very pretty, and as a result, there are many tourists that go there. But the other thing that we know about islands is that they, can, they offer isolation. So they tend to be isolated to some degree or other. And it's this feature of discreteness that has allowed them to serve as, as microcosms or whatever systems for understanding various um, processes in both ecology and evolution. And many of the ideas that have come out of the use of islands have come out of um, here, and in particular through the work of, of, of Edward Wilson. And this is one of the most well-known ideas about islands is that they, you tend to, in terms of ecological relationships and, and affinities, islands tend to exhibit a balance between immigration and extinction. And what, in their paper that they wrote together, MacArthur and Wilson argued that the number of species on an island at any given time is a balance between immigration and extinction. And so this is, immigration is, a, is affected by proximity to a source of pro, pro, propagules, while extinction is, is um, related to the size of the island. And so this, this idea really is a very, it's a straightforward idea and um, was served, has served as the foundation for much work in um, island biology, island ecology. But there was another feature of islands that is equally important um, in a somewhat different way. And this is something that Jonathan again just alluded to, and you'll hear much more about by the sounds of things when Rosemary and Peter Grant come. And so the, we know that islands that are isolated have served as the foundation for evolutionary processes. And this started from the, the work of, of Darwin, looking at the Galapagos finches that I'm not going to say anything more about, except that they, they form this, this because of their, their isolation, you can get evolution occurring on a kind of microcosmal st scale. And it's, it's understandable. You can actually see what's going on. And this is another quote from the MacArthur and Wilson book, where they, they actually, for, for half of the book, they, they've, they talked about evolutionary processes and talked about near the outer limit of dispersal of a given taxon. 
Speciation and exchange of newly formed autochthonous species within an archipelago can outrun immigration. And this is termed, or at least was termed, has been termed, the radiation zone. So you can see here you've got the Galapagos being the radiation zone, at least to some extent, for these um, finches in, in th this archipelago. Actually, a very similar group made it out to Hawaii. And Hawaii is, for birds, it's, it's supremely isolated. And so you've got the same kind of um, ancestor, roughly, arriving in, in Hawaii. And instead of this um, group of birds that, that Scott apparently said he couldn't tell the difference between, I won't go through. <laughs> so you've got um, a, a radiation of birds that are tremendously diverse. And you could easily tell um, you know, they're, they're extremely recognizable and um, just a tremendous diversity of birds that is generated in large part because of the supreme isolation of the islands. So let's look a little bit more at Hawaii. So, so here you've got Hawaii. So, so it's the, the most isolated archipelago in the world. And so you think about it in terms of the beaches and the sand, and, and that's why a lot of tourists go. But when you're thinking about the biology of the islands, you have to kind of obliterate those thoughts and put your eyes skywards and go into the mountains. This is where you get the, the large numbers of endemic species up in the mountains here, which um, live largely in the cloud forest. And you get forests that are very wet. Some of them are scrub, um, bog-like habitats. But what characterizes most of them is the supreme wetness. Now, this has been something that, that has been discussed as, as you know, the, the things that have evolved here are characterized by adaptations to this very wet, often quite cold, forest. And so you say, well, what's known about the biology? I told you about the birds. The birds are, have also, they're in, in not in good shape because a lot of them have gone extinct. But what about everything else in Hawaii? So just a little bit of history here. So I want to give you a feel now for what things were like when I first got to Hawaii. So the story starts at the turn of the, so, so kind of the 1890s. And this is really where it starts, with RCL Perkins. So Perkins was sent over to the Hawaiian Islands to do a survey of the fauna. And so Perkins, has, Perkins did the most incredible observations of the, of the biota. But he tended to work on his own. And in fact, he writes about the importance of doing this work on your own. And so this is an interesting, um, reading the introduction to the Fauna Hawaiians is really fascinating. But he said, I was obliged to carry a limited supply of oil and a small oil stove on the account of the difficulty or impossibility of making a fire during the continuous and heavy rains for the purpose of cooking rice. This will be as much as the collector will care to pack in so rough a country. And I found the stove and oil a, a sore burden, very re reluctantly assumed. So the thing here is that he, um, he did, uh, it was against all odds. Just, just kind of a background here with um, Perkins. You know, he, as I said, he was um, born in the late 1800s. He came from, from Oxford and was strongly influenced by um, Poulton, who was a study who, who worked on animal coloration. And then he came to, to Hawaii through the actions of, of a committee set up by the British Association and the Royal Society. And this is just an excerpt from um, the proceedings of the, from the, the British Association of Advancement of Sciences in 1892. It's just saying, you know, they were sending Perkins out to, this, to, to Hawaii to see what was there because they'd heard up to this point, all they'd heard was, well, the birds are dying out and um, there's really not a whole lot of anything else there. And so Perkins went to just see exactly what was there. Now, he spent many years there, 10 years in the Hawaiian Islands, collecting all groups of terrestrial animals. And the thing is there that he immersed himself in the forest. He, he just lived in the forest. And so 
he got he became very familiar with with the the environment the, his observations were astute he over the years then he uh, um he wanted to stay after he'd finished and got various um various positions in particular with the board of agriculture and he became the the director of the new division of entomology in the Hawaiian Sugar Planters Association. And this is mostly biocontrol, but Perkins kept on with his work, which was on um, working on the arthropods of the islands. He retired to England in 1912 and got you know, the gold medal of the Linnaean Society of London, elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1920, and died in 1955. But the thing is, his major contributions, though, they, they can't be over, overemphasized. He, um, his collections resulted in the Fauna Hawaiiensis in three volumes, more than 2,000 pages. But the thing is, what he did in this work was he, he sent out a lot of the specimens to, to authorities across the world. But the thing is that he had actually made so many observations of the material. And in the introduction, he argued that species arose through a series of events involving divergence in geographical isolation followed by speciation, with competition increasing as new species were added. Think what was going on in the world when he was writing that, when he was thinking that up. This was before Darwin's ideas were, were accepted. And so he was really, um, he, he was developing all of these ideas himself, just sitting alone, watching, looking at the biota of the Hawaiian Islands. He also came up with ideas about invasions and the issues with, with species invasions. But perhaps, oops, um, Sorry, just a little, here we go. Perhaps most importantly here um, was that he um, was able to take these minute observations of organisms. And so here, um, I'm just showing you here just some of the, the, the flies, are, are the, the behavior of the flies. And the important thing here is that these were observations that Perkins made. He said some of the species are quite conspicuous and are readily affected by the sap oozing from a broken limb of a tree or from exudations caused by decay or disease. Very many breed in stems. This is information that, that kind of went unknown, un, uh, unrecognized for many, many years after this. So his observations were critically important. So what happened after that? Just to kind of bring you up to date on, on the history here, the next real event um, in Hawaiian entomology was Elwood Zimmerman. Elwood Zimmerman was also of, um, also came out of good British stock, but um, he he did he he grew up though in um, UC Berkeley, and wh when he um, he he became as a young student involved in the Pacific Entomology Survey, and then went um, he got this cadre of friends at at um, UC Berkeley, and then. Through this cadre of friends as an undergraduate, he went on to start work on the biota of the Hawaiian Islands. And it, he, again, he felt like he could do it single-handedly. And so he worked really single-handedly on the insects of Hawaii. This is a monograph modeled on the insects of Western North America by, by E.O. Essig. But this, he started again in the introduction, just describing why he was doing what he was doing and the importance of, of you know, having all of the information in, in his own head. But he did an amazing feat, focusing on the insects. Um, so, so he worked on almost all groups of insects except the diptera. And then it was afterwards that he went on to, to doing graduate work and um, getting his PhD from the University of London in 1956. And spending a lot of time then at the, at the British Museum. So this is kind of the lay of the land until we get to about um, the 70s or so. And it was then that... Um, that given the, this extensive knowledge of diptera in particular, and the knowledge that, that Hawaiian Drosophila were very diverse, Hampton Carson came to the University of Hawaii. 
And Hampton Carson was a geneticist, and um, he actually went as a medical geneticist to the University of Hawaii. And he was, became intrigued by the, all the Hawaiian Drosophila, and, and he talked to Elmer Hardy, and um, he also talked to Zimmerman. But so at that point, Zimmerman said, well, he'd taken care of the Drosophila, and so it was all under control. But it was then, though, that Hampton Carson, because he was a geneticist, became intrigued in the evolutionary history of the Drosophila. And this is from an early work he did where he looked at these giant chromosomes that you get in Drosophila and pieced together relationships just based simply on these, these, the, the morphology of the chromosomes. Just an amazing piece of work. When you think, you know, how you just get DNA sequences and do it all automatically. Anyway, he aligned all these, these, these chromosomes and figured out the relationships between many of these, in particular the Hawaiian picture-winged flies. So this, is, um, this was really the, the foundation of, of evolutionary work in Hawaii. And after that, there was, during the, the, the 1970s, it was really through the work of, of Hamp Carson, along with a couple of others in particular, Dieter Mueller Dumbois, who's a still a vegetation um, biologist and done a lot of work in the islands, but the, they, they got funding for this international biological program to, to start working in particular focusing on conservation and in particular on groups that were at that time relatively well known. So this is really when I came into the scene. And so this, in the 70s and 80s, there was a resurgence of of emphasis on the biota of the islands. And so the people involved were really Frank Howarth, who worked mostly on caves, Wayne Gagne, who actually tragically died the year that I got to Hawaii, and Steve Montgomery. And these people were all eminent field biologists. You see here, this is Steve Montgomery, who's just um, showing me here a, a Eupathesia caterpillar. And so it was really through the observations of, of these people that all of a sudden, after these long hiatuses, you've got recognition of actually what, look what it's, isn't that cool? Um, so that's a, a Eupathesia catching a, a fly. But um, you got finally recognition of actually the tremendous diversity in this, these islands, which had largely been forgotten since the time of, of um, really since the time of Perkins, because Zimmerman was focused mostly on um, cataloging and, and keying out the specimens that were there. So when I arrived then, so my focus, as you heard, is on spiders. And so what were things like when, when I got to Hawaii? So when I got there, I, first of all, I didn't know anything about the spiders. And um, spiders did get to Hawaii. You, and you think, how did they get there? What, they, what spiders do is balloon. So when they, they're little, they let out silk and the silk catches in the wind, you see, when catches, pulls, silk, pull, pulls, 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 off they go. And so this is ballooning. See, you see that the wind is pulling, 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 off they go. And so they, they can travel very long distances. And it's through this ballooning behavior that presum presumably they reached um, the Hawaiian Islands. So when you look at the Hawaiian biota, I'll just give you just a couple of stories here, just... Um, of, of spiders. And one thing I should emphasize here, which is, not, which is a bit of an embarrassment, to be honest, these are, are extraordinary species on, on the island of Oahu. And they're, they're all different species here, and they're big. They're all undescribed. Um, this is one of them here. You see, um, this, is, this is one that was, it's also, I just call it bicolored jaws. It's, it specializes on amphipods. It's a big spider, um, but it's, it's undescribed. There's a huge amount of work um, still to be done here. And um, by far the majority of the spiders, and in fact the arthropods in general, are unknown and still undescribed. But the spiders, I should say, are unusually cool for, for, for anything, for any group of organisms. And I'll just give you one example here. This is, this is Dorianicus, which is actually a, a tetragnathid spider. But the cool thing about Dorianicus is that it's got these long claws 
on the ends of its first pair of legs. And so Darionychus was one of the first spiders. It was one of the spiders that had been described. It was one that, that Perkins collected, and it had been described by, by Simone in, in France. And so Eugene Simone, you know, he hadn't collected it. He was just looking at the collections from Perkins. And so he, um, he described it. He said, oh, it's got these extraordinary claws. Well, I, I don't know whether it was all in French and Latin, but anyway, my guess is he said that. But anyway, the point is that, that he described it, and it said on the description, Kauai. And if ever anyone's been to the island of Kauai, it's big, you know? It's, you, so you have, to, you have to really get in there to... F it's, it's not easy to find a spider in all of the island. So I got the, I got the specimen, it still just said Kauai on the label. And um, so anyway, after many years, I found this animal actually at low elevation in low elevation habitats. And this is the, the claw. Isn't that just really cool? With, and this is the end of the tarsus with all those spines. And so I was watching this spider, and what it does is it actually, it doesn't build a web. It just hangs below things, and then it'll swipe at an insect and impale it directly from the air using these, these long claws. So very, um, very unusual and, and extraordinary animals. But by and large, I mean, the reason th that, that I became so intrigued in, in working on, on these animals is in large part because I could really see what they were doing. And so this is taken at, at nighttime. These are all at, at nighttime. I mean, they're, they're just, just to show you kind of how you can observe these animals. They're just hanging out there. And so you can see what they like to eat. You can see where they like to live. You can see all of the animals living, you know, which ones are living together and why they're living together, what they like to do, how they're, you know, how much time they spend on the web, how much time they spend off the web, what they do when they run around. And so you can, they don't, they can't, they're not seeing, so they're just, you can just, do, you can watch whatever they want to do and, um, and take all of these ecological observations and really get a good feeling for the animals themselves. So this is what, what it was like then when, when I got to Hawaii. But as I said before, the mountains are, you're, you're dealing with animals in the mountains. So we're, we're, not, we're not talking about going swimming in the ocean. And we're, we're, we're talking about, about the high elevation forest. And so these are properties that are owned by the National Park, the Nature Conservancy, and various other agencies like that. When I got to Hawaii, there was actually the, the, the Nature Conservancy had just started there. Um, the Park Service had mandates. There was various state agencies that were just starting out. I make myself sound like I came out of the dark ages. Um, but anyway, there was, there was a lot of of work that was yet to be done, and there were very few people working in these high elevation habitats. And so the thing is, I had to, to figure out who to, yeah, I had to get someone to come with me, and so what do you do? And so I got my mom. Um, so this is, so my mom came out with me for, um, actually for, for a year or two, but I have to say it's a long way from Scotland. Um, so, so she came out and, um, so, so, and that, with that work, she was up for anything. And so then, you know, why do you drag your mom over every few weeks? And so I found someone else who, who was actually quite good at this stuff as well. He was up for anything. And um, so we got married. And so then <laughs> we had, uh, we had the, the F1 who came along with us into the field. Very unhelpful, I have to say, at the beginning. Um, and so after a while then, they, they got to be a little bit more productive. Um, not entirely so, but even he looks so pained, doesn't he? Um, but um, yes. So this is, how, um, this is how I started off working in the island. So when, when I first got there, actually, you know, the interest in the islands as for studying evolutionary processes was just picking up. And this is, um, this is really kind of where it started with, with um, Warren Wagner and Vicky Funk, who are currently both still at the Smithsonian. And they put together this really important book in 1995, I think it was published in the end, 
Hawaiian Biogeography and Evolution on a Hotspot Archipelago. And this was fundamentally important because it started to draw together the work that people were just starting to do on, on many different groups. And it was really the first attempt to test the idea that independently derived groups of Hawaiian organisms exhibit sim similar patterns of colonization and differentiation that relate, relate directly to the unique geological history of the islands. So, what this built on then was this phenomenon of a hotspot archipelago, which was actually, well, well it, was, it had been documented actually by Tuzo Wilson, the idea of hotspots, that actually hotspots are just, they're, they're like little bubbles coming out of the, the ocean. And so, so they're like a series of bubbles arising from a point beneath the island of Hawaii. So this is really how, how it works. And this is what, this is kind of fundamental to the work that I've been doing. So the islands then of, of the Hawaiian chain, they come from this hotspot. So the hotspot comes up and if you, what, and then what happens is the islands move away from the hotspot across over the Pacific Plate, which is moving up to the, to the northwest. And as the islands move away from the hotspot, they erode down and, and ultimately disappear. What does that mean for the biology? It means that you can kind of use the islands as almost as a fossil record. So this is kind of what I mean. Five million years ago, the islands were actually, the Kauai was just becoming a large island. The other islands were, were low and fairly far apart. And so, so for many of those, most organisms actually, they, they disappeared during the time of Necker and, and Nahoa. They, they were just very low islands. There's a few that, that, that do, do come from there. But by and large, things started to colonize from the mainland over to Kauai five million years ago. And then two and a half million years ago, you've got Oahu appearing. They tended to jump from the older to the younger islands. Then you've got Maui Nui fo forming. They jump from the older to the younger islands. And so on again, you've got the big island forming. They tended to go from Maui Nui to the big island. And then finally, you've got the big island. And so that means that you've got five million year old communities, two and a half to three million, and then about one, one and a half million, and then to, to the present, what, that's just beginning to develop. So you can read this sequence really as, as a fossil record to look at the dynamics of diversification through time. So just, you can also look at how communities assemble over that chronological sequence. So basically what it allows you to do is look at the islands. So you're, you're looking at them, looking at five million years to just, just beginning to, to form. So you're looking across this chrono sequence and basically each island represents a new start to evolutionary change and community assembly. So what does that mean then? It means that you can look at kind of slices over evolutionary time. So you can look at ecological processes that are happening you know, in and, and just beginning to start on the youngest island, and then they're just a bit older, up to five million years old. You can look at what the properties of the communities are like. At the same time, you can look at evolutionary processes over that time and just see what evolution likes after, evolution looks like after, you know, zero time and then going up to, to five million years old. And so when you put those together, you can start getting an understanding of biodiversity dynamics, basically how things accumulate over, over time. So, okay, so, so let's see how we might use that. And I'm gonna go over some of these slides fairly quickly, but the point is um, here that there's a lot of groups that have, um, that, that have started their diversification on Kauai, and, and they've just hopped down the island chain. Here are just two examples of Shishidea, which are um, one group of 
plants. This is um, Psychotria, another group of plants. This is a, a, a genus of crickets, work of Kerry Shaw. And here you see they're going from green to, to red, which is the oldest island to the youngest. And by and large, you get um, the progression from the, from the green through the orange to the blue to the red. So they progress down the island chain, although you can get diversification within it. And in many groups, you find this. But what's different about different groups is how they diversify. And you say, well, how is there a common pattern here? We know something about snails. So snails, you know, are, are occur, this is on Oahu. There's an incredible radiation of Acutinella snails across the islands. And they're, 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 there's a different species in every little nook and cranny. So in, in the, the Acutinella, they show this progression again down the island chain, at least starting on Oahu. And they, they've, they've gone into all these nooks and crannies, but um, they haven't really um, undergone a true adaptive radiation. So let's just see then what spiders do. And what I'm going to do here is actually tell you several stories. So, so how do spiders evolve across this chrono sequence? And so here we've, we've got, to, we're, we're going to look at several groups. And the first story I'm going to tell you is about Orson Welles. So this is a, a genus that was described by Gustavo Hormiga. It's a big, fat spider. It's in the family Linophiidae. Um, Gustavo likes Orson Welles' plays, and so he, um, he just named the, the spiders Orson Welles and then the, the different species Orson Welles' plays. But um, the point here is... <laughs> that, that what, what we're going to look at is how they diversified. So we used lots of molecular markers, and I'm not going to go into all of these. I'm going to show you the patterns. And so, so what, using all these markers, what, what we found was that, first of all, they hopped down the island chain. So you've got the oldest species up here. You've got the youngest here. So they hopped down the island chain. There's Kauai, Oahu, Maui Nui, and the big island. So nice hopping down. But now, if we start using it as a chrono sequence, so going from the youngest to the oldest, what do you find? So we're saying, you know, what happens on the very young islands going to the very old? So you've got one species on this huge island, the youngest island. And then you go to three species on, on this big, you know, Maui Nui complex. And then three on this much smaller Oahu. And then, what, one, two, three, four, five, six species on Kauai, the oldest, smallest island. So I'll come back to this. But for now, what seems to be happening here is you've got something, an animal colonizing a new island. And it, it goes everywhere. And then over time, you get just basically fragmentation of, of its range and speciation in, in different isolated pockets without any adaptation to any of the new environments. So what it seems here is that you get, get diversification over time. It's non-adaptive in allopatry. So what, what do you find then? On each island, you get colonization of the same form with no evident ecological change. But that's not the whole story. And here I'll just introduce, this is a, a, a really large genus of, of Lepidoptera, Microlepidoptera, in the, the genus Hyposmacoma. And this is work by, by Dan Rubinoff in a paper he published recently with Will Haynes. And what they found was that in this genus, you get early divergence into these distinct ecological forms. Candy wrappers, these are the kinds of, um, the, these, these little um, cones that they make to protect themselves. But what's interesting, within those ecological forms, what they do, so early ecological differentiation, and then they hop down the island chain. So, so here you've got early differentiation into all these ecological forms, and then they just simply keep doing their ecological thing and then hop down the island chain. And what's interesting, in spiders, do you find that? Yes, you do. And so here we've got, this is work that Jessica Garb, a grad student, did in my lab. And so Jessica was working on, on these spiders that are a really well-known adaptive radiation, at least based on the work of, that Perkins had done. And so she, she looked at these things and found that the early ecological divergence had all happened on Kauai. So you see all of the ecological forms are represented on the oldest island. 
And then what they did, and it's easiest to see here, um, so Kauai, they go to Oahu, and then Maui, and then the Big Island. So here again, what you find is diversification early in the radiation, it's adaptive, but then the populations, are, are the, they diverge without, without any further ecological change. They just hop down the island chain, and basically, after doing all the ecological divergence early on, they just simply jump down the island chain without changing ecologically. So then you say, OK, this one, you've got colonization of the same form that evolved on the oldest island, and then just hopping down the island chain. But that's not all the story. We've seen two stories here. So let's just look at some of the others. And this is, this is the story that you find in a number of groups. And this is where they hop down the island chain and diversify within islands. And these are ones that are really intriguing. And so this is, these are Ariamne's stick spiders. Extraordinary animals, aren't they? You look at, you know, this one's camouflaged on white lichen. This one's under leaves. It's gold with red on it. These ones are down in the, the rocks and crevices. So you get all of this diversity. How did it evolve? Um, so here, this is super preliminary. Um, and again, a lot of the species are undescribed. But what you find, again, they've started, the oldest groups are, are on Kauai. And so you, they hop down the island chain from the oldest to, to, down to the younger islands. But look, here's a brown one that lives down in the bark, a gold one under leaves. And here you've got gold, white, and brown, again, on Oahu. Look at Maui and Molokai, a whole bunch of white, gold, gold, and brown, all together on that archipelago. And so you've got, it, they've repeatedly evolved the same form. Then you come to the big island, and there are populations, actually, from, from the older islands. They're, they're not monophyletic, and, which is another story that we, we won't get to hear. But this shows you how you can actually say, well, this is a five million year old community and this is, what, this is what has happened in these different slices of time with the very youngest island just being populations from the older islands. So the important thing here though for now is that you get evolution of ecomorphs with repeated evolution of the same forms over and over again. So let's now come and look at familiar territory again. So these are long-jawed spiders that you were introduced to earlier on. So long-jawed spiders, a genus Tetragnatha. And so these spiders are the ones that I worked with in, in Tennessee, came over to Hawaii, found that actually they were all over in the forest in, in Hawaii. They weren't just over water. And so they're very easy to work with. They still build flimsy webs, but they're really diverse. And so when I started working in, in Hawaii, you know, rather than just the, the boring old ones, um, you get this tremendous array of species with um, you know, ones that, that don't spin webs and just wander around the vegetation and then all sorts of different species with different ecological spe specializations, often adapted to <coughs> tiny bits of, of habitat. So extremely diverse and um, extremely specialized. And so it was this diversity that really appealed to me right from, from the beginning. And I started to work on one lineage of these spiders, the spiny legged ones. And what I found with these was that they exhibited like like the, the Ariamnes, they exhibited discrete forms. So you get a big brown one, a green one, a little brown one, and a maroon one. When you do a phylogeny, when you look at their evolutionary relationships, what you find is that you get the green ones, which look identical. These, all these green ones, are, they look so similar, but they're actually not each other's closest relatives. Likewise, maroon, it's popped out over and over again. The big brown ones here, the little brown ones here. So you get repeated evolution of the same form. So on each island, you get repeated evolution of the same form across species. So you say, well, there's, there's a lot going on even within spiders. But let's have one more story here. And we have to talk about the happy face spider. So the happy face spider is a single species. And what's interesting here is that you get all of these different color forms within the same species. So, so this color 
is the most common form. All the rest are just a whole gamut that you get in the population. So you get, this is the most common, and then all of these different colors. And so why do they have all the colors? The idea is that it's, um, it's all because of these very vicious birds. The argument is that it's apostatic selection that's maintaining the color polymorphism in each population, that it's frequency dependent selection for, for to, to, um, ex to build up the, the rare, rare forms so that any one common form can't be subject of, of, of the bird's ability to develop a search image. So, okay, well, by that, at least for now, how, have they, how are they arranged across the Hawaiian Islands? What you see is that across the Hawaiian Islands, you get very discrete populations. This is even though, I mean, it's the same species, but you get very discrete structure across the islands. So they've actually, you know, that even though they're the same species, they're, they're very discrete populations. But here it gets really interesting. So we did a lot of crosses between different colors. And so here you have yellow and red front. And so yellow is the most common allele in the, in the population. So the reds tend to be heterozygote. So you cross a yellow and a red front, half will come out yellow and half red front. It's very straightforward. It's just like Mendel's peas, but just much more fun. Um, so you say, well, that's all fine. You come over to the big island that, that was on Maui, where we did the initial crosses. Come over to the big island. What do you find? So you find that you do the same crosses, and the same thing happens. The red front comes out half, yellow half, but all the red fronts are male, and all the yellows are female. And you can actually do a cross between islands. So a yellow male from Maui and a yellow female from Hawaii. And the males will come out red front and the females yellow. Now, this is something that, that's been really intriguing to us as to what went on. But I'm not going to get into it except to say this is what seems to have happened. They've colonized, we know based on genetic data, from the older to the younger island. And so basically what's happened is you've just got a few individuals presumably col colonizing from the older to the younger islands. And then you get selection to recover the diversity of the previous island. And this is something we're trying to look at now, that as to how exactly that, that happened. What, so basically what you're seeing here is that on each island you get repeated evolution of the same form within a species. So the thing is here now, what you can see is that on each island you get different patterns of diversification even within spiders. You get colonization in the same form with no evident ecological change. Colonization in the same form that evolved on the oldest island. Or you get repeated evolution of the same form across species. Or you get repeated evolution of the same form within a species. So all sorts of things going on. So what I want to touch on in the last part here is just what this means then to how communities assemble. We know that they've got all of these different ways of diversifying. So this is what, um, this is work that we're doing now as part of a big NSF initiative, how do communities assemble? And we're looking across the island chrono sequence. And what you find there, looking across the chrono sequence, we know that there's a change across the chrono sequence. We know based on um, Peter Vatusek, who's an eminent um, soil chemist, ecologist, system ecologist. He studied the soil systems across these islands. And so we know that the phosphorus-nitrogen ratios have changed across this island chain. And he's, he's documented this really quite um, specifically. And what, what we wanted to do just initially was just look at that and see whether the spiders actually show the same kind of pattern. And what I'll just show you just quickly here. Um, this is what a, a graduate student did in my lab, looking at to whether, as to whether the spiders show the same pattern of nitrogen and phosphorus accumulation across the chrono sequence. But this is leaves, and this is spiny-like spiders, web-building spiders, spider-eating spiders. And going across the age gradient, they ratchet up so that you get the highest nitrogen ratios on the oldest substrates on the big island. I'm not going to say anything more about that for now, um, but just the point is that they show this, 
they match the substrate age. They show the same kinds of things as the soil is doing, even though that, that they're living quite close together. But when we look across the, the sequence, though, one thing we found is that as, they go, as you go across the sequence, what you find is the, the numbers of species across the sequence changes in different groups. So in some groups, they keep accumulating to the oldest islands. This is at wind plants, and this is work that I did with, with Bruce Baldwin. And we found that in plants, the most diverse groups, they just go, the numbers of species on islands go, goes, starts low, but then goes way up, and then drops down on the older islands. In smaller groups, they keep diversifying, chugging along to the oldest island. And you get exactly the same thing in, um, in, in animals, in different animal groups. They, they, some of the smaller ones, they just chug along, and the, older, the bigger ones, they diversify quickly, and, um, and you get this, these very large numbers of species, and um, they drop down on the older islands. Now, I'm not, what I want to do is just say here, how does this relate to the stories we've been telling about the, how the different spiders diversify? And this is what really quite interesting, I think. So here you've got Orson Wells, and here the, all, the highest number of species on the oldest island. This is a non-adaptive radiation. The, jump, the crab spiders, you get very quickly, you get to, to high numbers of species, and then they just level off. In the Ariamnes and Tetragnatha, High numbers early, and then they drop off. So these are the patterns you get. The Orson Welles just keeps just, just skyrocketing. If it, there were older islands, they'd be overrun with, with Orson Welles. I don't know. But anyway, the point is you get different patterns of accumulation over time. And so this is really why, at the moment, we've started now just to focus on the youngest island of Hawaii, where things are just happening. So we've now got a big project based specifically on the youngest island. And what we're doing is looking at this, just how things change across the island sequence. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to understand how communities come together, how evolution starts over this, this um, time period of, of, of the very young island. So we try to control for as much as we can and then just look across the geological sequence. So what we're doing then is just using lots of different methods for, for sampling the, the biota. And from this, we're collecting all arthropods from canopy sampling, beading, um, tree clipping, using all of these, these methods to get quantitative assessments of all of the biota. And we're using these estimates then to generate metrics of the community. And so I'll just touch on this super briefly, but the real thing here is what we're trying to do is um, get some predictability as to what's going on. So this is work that I'm currently doing with John Hart, where, where he generates predictions of species abundance distribution based on these, these um, very statistical metrics of how you package energy through individuals to species most parsimoniously. So what he does then is just generate predictions based on what is called the maximum entropy theory of ecology, just looking at what the expectation of species abundance might be for a given habitat. And so the black lines are the predictions, and the orange and well the, the circles are different ages of habitats. And so you see in the oldest habitat, this is based on very preliminary data for detritivorous arthropods, but you can see on all these islands, the match to the statistical expectation is very close. Where it deviates is on the youngest island, which might be expected because it's just things are just getting going there. So you say, well, what, what really can that tell you? It can just tell you that something's going on. And so what we're trying to do now is at the same time look at species interactions. So we're building networks to try and get an understanding of the predictability of changes in network structure again across the chrono sequence. So this is work mostly with Neo Martinez and again with John Hart and others and in particular my graduate student um, Andy Rominger. But the point here then is that 
What we're doing is using this dynamic geomorphology of the youngest Hawaiian island to determine the importance of changing functional roles of taxa as, as they differentiate and assemble, and then look at the feedbacks from that dynamic community into fostering diversification. So essentially, this is a synthesis of ecology and evolutionary biology to understand differentiation and diversification as communities assemble. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I just want to end so that you don't think I'm just talking, you know, I've, I have no clue what's going on in Hawaii. Um, so, as I said, the most isolated archipelago in the world, no longer. It's basically, you've shrunk the Pacific Ocean. And so you've got the, the isolations lost, and so alien propagules are arriving faster than ever. So one of the questions we're trying to look at now is how are communities responding to the new dynamic? So we've got, if you look at invasive species, there's gazillions of them. They're everywhere you look. And, you know, you think, uh, you know, how in the world do you deal with that? That's me vainly pulling up ginger plants. This is, a, this is what the Waikamoi Preserve on, on East Maui. This is ginger. And this is, they're trying to keep it out of the preserve. And you think, oh, yikes, you know, where is it going from here? And so this is one story that I'll just end with here. You think, this is just hopeless. What can we possibly do at this point? I've got a very close colleague who works on East Maui, Art Madeiras. And what I want you to do is, is look down here at these little spots here. This, this, play, this area here that is entirely, almost entirely pasture, this was the last remaining dry forest on, on all of the islands. So what Art did was he actually um, got the community together. They physically removed the grass fenced off an area and actually planted native plants and then planted, replanted them outside. So look at this little patch here. What do you see? This is what he's done now. This is what you'll see if you look on Google Earth. You'll see these symmetrical patches. He started here, expanded there, and now they're going to here. And so what you find when you, when you look at these, these patches, it's actually, you know, the forest has really grown up. It's, it's actually coming back. So, so it gives you hope that there's something that can be done. And with that, I've got a many, many people to thank for all of this work, but thank you in particular to you for coming, and I'd be happy to answer questions if there was time. Thank you.